Right, um, I want to talk about community and research. And to be honest, this completely complements um, everything that Mike talked about. Because what we're seeing within my particular sphere, which is landscape archaeology, is that community projects are taking the lead in doing pure research. And this is something which started out thinking, oh, this is a fantastic idea, and this is really, really important, and is actually now actually becoming the mainstay of some of the research that's been done in one particular aspect or type of archaeology. <coughs> I should say that that is the game that I'm particularly in. I'm a landscape archaeologist for my sins, of which I have many. Um, but, and I think you all know the background for all of this, the sort of techniques that we're using are very varied from the traditional ones. We don't use trowels, we don't use... JCBs and ditching buckets, but we do use things like documentary, total stations, uh, aerial photography, and drones. And these are the set techniques which we, as professional archaeologists, are in a position where we can try and disseminate to local groups, where the local groups then reciprocate and provide us with um, a feedback to actually take pure research and landscape archaeology forward. Um, I should say that what I want to do is to talk with three particular case studies to give examples where there's some fantastic, really valuable and extremely important research is being undertaken with community groups. And the fact that we've done by community is not so much just, shall we say, is actually completely and totally enhancing um, the process. Um, I should add that, uh, just moving very quickly on, uh, yeah, more sort of techniques, just to give you an idea that uh, uh, also, the bottom left one is reinforced the fact that much of the area that I work in is the northwest and the northeast, where we have a fair number of hills. Um, areas which have survival of some remarkable landscapes where you don't need the trout, you don't even need the GCB, where actually the archaeological surfaces are sitting on the surface and all they need to be is recorded. Um, and uh, that is one of the reasons, given the fact that I have to live up in Yorkshire, is one of the reasons why actually my case studies aren't in Merseyside. And I apologise profusely for that, but nevertheless, it does highlight the fact that landscape archaeology is something that can be done anywhere and something which is enormously useful. The background to all of this, let's put that down where it may work better, is that for a long time, landscape survey has been undertaken um, as a professional activity. Um, it's been done from a perspective of management. Um, and now the case in point is the fact that we've been doing archaeological, well I've been doing archaeological work for the last 30 years, but, um, but only really since the 1990s were we doing what we call identification surveys. And these are technique which cover huge areas, literally thousands of square kilometres, they're very, very rapid, they uh, score literally tens or even hundreds of thousands of sites and monuments. And it's a simple process of basically tramping across the ground, um, identifying a site, um, recording with a GPS, uh, taking a photograph, and moving on. And the whole point about this is their management. The idea is one of the most important things we have in our archaeological world is to protect and preserve what we have. That is our primary aim. To my mind, the professional archaeologist is to keep what we've got for the future. But after that, we want to be able to do academic research. We want to be able to understand our landscape, and we understand their development. And the problem with it is just having a brief description, a photograph, and a GPS location doesn't really satisfy that requirement. So although these things have been fantastic, um, from the point of view of management, from the point of view of academic research, uh, they've been fairly inadequate. And to add insult to injury, we've also, the grants available for this type of survey has dropped off substantially. So, what's been the solution? That's the sort of thing that's typically produced. It's a dot on a map. And from a management point of view, it's crucial. From the point of view of understanding, not a lot. Really doesn't like me, this thing. Um, let's see if I can. So, into the sphere, we come with community type work. This is the vacuum that has been uh, left by the loss of the identification type survey, has been filled by HLF, mainly funded community projects. The key thing about these things is the projects are not orientated 
um, by such things as rescue. We're not going to some obscure site in the middle of nowhere, um, which happened to be affected by a road scheme. Or are we trying to deal with management? We're actually undertaking work which are primarily research-led. They use not just simply walking across a landscape, but we're using a full range of techniques, everything that we possibly can to better understand a landscape. So from documentary studies, detailed surveys, and finding excavations, we are actually doing primary research. But the most important thing is we're taking community groups every inch of the way. The idea is it's not just simply us taking advantage of an opportunity, it's to be able to train and teach local community groups um, about the possibility of where we go. This is the first of my three um, case studies. It's called Holwick. Um, it's on the Tees, um, and it's actually quite a small area. It's about two and a half square kilometres. And I have to say, the first time I got involved in this, I thought, two and a half square kilometres? We could do that in no time, professionally. Thought, no problem at all, we could do it in a couple of days. But the reality is that that's not the way that we're actually undertaking it as part of this sort of project. It's intensive. We're using every single different technique we can use. It's basically getting the communities involved, doing their research, um, and it's done as part of the Altogether Archaeology project. And the whole idea was to try and get them involved and get them enthused um, about undertaking this sort of work. We of course use documentary studies, that's a, a fundamental aspect of the whole thing, um, but it's only the start. Uh, we're also using other such techniques as aerophotography, um, using such little devices like that. Now I have to admit that normally we try and use community element at all stages, couldn't quite get them in that, cockpit only takes two people and it's very, very tight. But nevertheless, in almost all other respects, community involvement um, has been what we're trying to do in terms of all of this. The other most important technique, and I we combine that with the aerial photography, is a thing called LIDAR, which I'm sure you know about, but just to remind you, it's a scanned data that you have from an aircraft, um, and it provides some really useful and rather remarkable data sets. That is our landscape. Have I got a zapper somewhere? No, no, no zapper. Um, that's our landscape that we've got, and you can see all of this, these ridges. Huge amount of cultivation terracing. Gives you an idea of this is a remarkable, incredibly uh, intricate, medieval cultivated landscape. And you can see the survival of that, and every single terrace is brought out with an enormous amount of degree of, uh, of detail, simply by a technique which basically um, you can in effect buy off the internet. Um, and I say, now it's free, I should add. But the point about it is, through this various techniques, photography, field walking, trumbling across the ground with volunteers, and taking a lot of time looking at every single intricate element, we end up with some remarkable statistics. Two and a half square kilometres, a total of 116 uh, sites per square kilometres, 292 in total and 700 uh, terraces or lynchets. I have to say, it's the most densely concentrated landscape I have ever come across. Um, 116 sites per square kilometre is nothing uh, but quite remarkable. But that doesn't change the fact that what we're doing is being able to actually come up with a story, a picture of how this landscape developed. And we're looking at, in this case, a landscape which started at least in some elements in the Mes Mesolithic and has moved all the way through. Very quickly on. But I also want to talk, it's about techniques. We can come in as professional archaeologists and go in and blitz the whole thing with modern GPSs. Um, we can use the best techniques we've got available. But from the point of view of training and teaching local groups, that are a bit of a disaster. Um, survey grade GPSs cost um, 11, 10,000 pounds, that sort of thing. It's not something within the budget of your average local group. Um, and the other thing is, they're not very good for training. Even professional archaeologists, if you actually put them to the crunch, probably would not be able to tell you how their GPS works, how it comes up with their data. Um, so we go back to first principles, and we use things like a plane table, because they're easy to understand, they're easy to grasp, and in theory, they're affordable. They're not. Plane table is not, because bizarrely, of all things, they become antiques. 
people put them on their mantelpieces. Um, they prize them, and these little brass alidades um, are prized out of all, and they're very, very expensive. Whereas, this really isn't going to work. We use an alternative, which is using a thing called, thing called a theodolite, an optical theodolite with a disto on top. Very effective, four man's total station. Each element worth about £100, so you can get the whole kit for something like £200. So we're in a situation where we can provide them groups, local groups, with equipment that they can afford and do valuable and important archaeological survey. And the number of the groups that we've worked with have actually taken advantage of that. And that is important because the research that we're doing here is being furthered by the local archaeological groups. They can actually go on beyond this and actually do their own research. And that, from my point of view, is absolutely crucial. But I want to just quickly mention one particular site, just to give you an idea of the sort of level of the research um, that we're actually coming up in terms of the results. This is what we've euphemistically called our Romano British settlement. Um, and it's just one example of the type of issues that we've got with this type of that site. It looks very nice. Few roundhouses, enclosed, the sort of thing we traditionally regard as being um, sort of Iron Age Romano British. But in actuality, the deep research that we did into it, the detailed survey coupled with the aerophotography, demonstrated it's actually part of a field system with a cornergist there, which runs all the way over to there. And this is a later enclosure. In other words, a later bank to turn what was originally an unenclosed settlement into an enclosed settlement suddenly you start beginning to realise that what we've actually got is a settlement which is going back further and further and further back in time. We're seeing something which is originally an unenclosed settlement, perhaps before climatic deteriorations in the Iron Age, perhaps we're talking about something which even goes back to the Bronze Age. And we shouldn't perhaps be enormously surprised by that, because, no, I don't know exactly the point at it, right up in the top part of this image, which is the aerial photograph, there is actually a ring cairn. So we've got Bronze Age landscapes within about 100 yards of this particular settlement. We've got a wonderful example of a field system. We've got a medieval later reuse. Here is its field system. There is its field system. But this, ultimately, is the original part of a field system that potentially goes back late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. One of the things which I love about it is the fact that here we've got this wonderful old field boundary, and here you see it continues as a dry stone wall. So you've got elements of a landscape continuing in use now that have their origins that go back something like potentially 2,000 years BC. So you're finding this level of continuity in the landscape, which is absolutely quite remarkable. Um, and it's one of the things which I find about that. So you've got everything. You've got potentially Bronze Age, you've got Romano-British Iron Age, uh, medieval, and even elements continue through to the... This is what doing pure research into landscapes is able to tell you. And this is just this one simple example, and I can tell you there are a thousand sites like this all the way across this one two and a half square kilometre region. Different little stories. What we're saying is doing these sort of techniques is capable of bringing up an understanding of how the landscape has developed. Um, well, sorry, uh, to the next slide. But of course, it's not just uh, prehistoric, it's not just Iron Age, it's also medieval. Every single one of those purple lines is a cultivation terrace. And you can see the level to which arable farming dominated this in the medieval period. Absolutely remarkable. And we're also finding that we've got a huge number of medieval settlements to accompany. It's not just simply arable farming, nothing accompanying it, but you've got medieval settlements all over, uh, which typically are what we call the ringar, which is basically the outer margins of an area of land. Beyond <coughs> was pastoral land, inside was arable land. And the ringar kept the two separate, so the animals stopped there, couldn't eat all the food inside. And guess what? All settlements are around, actually, at the margin. So one side, they face onto the open moor. The other side, they face onto the inside. So you can see this wonderful idea about how the whole medieval field system 
uh, working system develop simply by doing these sort of levels of surveys. Um, brilliant sort of story, fantastic reconstruction um, of a landscape. Um, but as I say, this is something that we're doing in conjunction with the local community, we're doing with the, the volunteers, and they are seeing the development of understanding how the landscape has worked, has developed, and has built up, and we've come up with basically being able to produce detailed reports and ultimately publication, which gives you the development of a small bit of the Tees Valley. Fantastic story, something which I still think is one of the more remarkable bits of landscape research uh, that we've done. And this is done entirely with the support of the local group. Moving very quickly on, Raven's Tube. Well, the background of this is fascinating because the people that we have worked with at Holwick got inspired. And they formed their own group. It's called the Tarndale Archaeology Group. Um, with one person called Phil Bio, who is primary instigation of the whole thing, very powerful, very emotive, <laughs> enthusiastic and passionate for his particular patch, which is just north of the wall. So we helped him, we provided him with equipment, we provided the group with training, we provided them allowed to do their own thing, and they started doing work initially, completely without any external funding, but then ultimately they started doing some more detailed work, which is Raven's Hue. So we've all, out of the Holwick project, we've had a completely new group formed, which is inspired to carry on the lessons that they have learned, because they realised how exciting and rewarding some of the archaeology they got is. And they ain't kidding, because Raven's Hue is an absolute gold mine. It's about three or four kilometres north of Hadrian's Wall, and it's got stone circles, rock art, stone rows. Corbury, Burton Mound, quite a bit more, Cairnfields, it's got roundhouses, it's got conservation lynch, it's got a huge amount of material which basically screams out that we've got an exciting and extremely important landscape. So I'm going to quickly move on, but I just want to say something about this. Again, we wanted to develop techniques and we wanted to take them on board, and so one of the th techniques that we wanted to use because we had rock art, we had large numbers of panels of rock art. So we used photogrammetry tool stage. So basically, that basic is a process whereby if you take lots of photographs of a single object from all the way around, you combine them and then exaggerate the vertical axis in order to be able to bring out the features on the surface. And this is not a photograph. This is a three-dimensional model that was created. They can do this quite easily. All they need is a camera. Um, bit of training, we showed them how to use the software and they were able to go through these 40 odd panels um, creating and producing three different dimensional models of everything they found. So in other words we're using photogrammetry all the way down the line on that. And it's a technique which they can use, a technique which they've been able to master, but we also use things like that, a drone, because there are wider elements of the landscape which is a bit of a struggle just to be able to do it from head height. And the case in point is this one, which I'm hoping that I'll be able to get to work using this. Yeah, it's going to go. Basically, that's a three-dimensional model created using photogrammetry. So it's not just simply a photograph. It's multiple photographs taken with a drone, um, creating basically a three-dimensional model of what is a four-poster stone circle. I know it's not round, and I know it's not a circle, but that's what we call it. It's a four-poster, and it's wonderful. And it's a characteristic feature of the uh, early to middle um, Bronze Age. Very diagnostic. There aren't that many of them. Most of them are in Scotland, but we do have at least one, um, which is goat stones, just to demonstrate. There you go. So I think you can appreciate the sort of richness um, of the landscape that we've got. Um, we had six burial cans. Um, that on, of those, four of them had rock art on them. Things like that one, which is the goat stones. Kirk Cairn, which had a portable uh, rock art. So we had a very close link between the rock art, burial cans, 
uh, funerary monuments, we have a real characteristic element of a ritual landscape. And the dating of this, we're talking about something that goes between sort of uh, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. Um, so we've got something which is an intrinsic and fascinating landscape. And if that was all it was, I'd be happy. I'd be thinking, that's good enough for me. I'm quite happy to go home. But it wasn't. Because we also had Kenfields. Large areas of Kenfields. All these things outlined. Kenfields there, Kenfields there. Um, elements of Kenfield over here. So what we've got is basically clearance cairns, the removal of stone from the ground in order to make it agriculturally viable, usually associated with pastoral agriculture. But in our case, we have a little bit more because we also have uh, huts at round cairns, sorry, round circles, and we also have little bits of lynches, which are elements of cultivation, which is what that is. So cairns associated with it, and we've got elements of cultivation. So we've got the move, the migration from pastoral primary farming, the initial occupation of the land, to starting to actually become uh, arable farmers, um, they're developing and moving on from that. And then, all change. Oh, sorry, no, before you that, also we had a burnt mound. In fact, we've got two burnt mounds. Again, I'll talk a bit about burnt mounds later. Wonderful sites, uh, but I will mention them in a second. But we also had things like Cordrick, huge areas, rampant Cordrick. We also had uh, pastoral enclosures. So we had a complete change from basically this little settlement to something which is essentially just being used for um, farming, and then this move to, to cord rig and arable cultivation. So we've got a complete change of landscape. So we're seeing a very, very complex development spanning over something like about 2,000 years. Um, initially, this ritual landscape, stone circles, funerary round cairns, rock art, like to be near the early Bronze Age. Then the land was settled and farmed, mixed economy by the Kenfields, probably like to be Middle Bronze Age. Change of land use character almost completely, and this ties in with some of the paleobotanic data that we've got, which shows a significant change um, round about in terms of usage and in terms of vegetation round about the beginning of the Iron Age. Then, possibly towards the back end of the Iron Age, we then get a complete change again. So we are seeing a fantastic transition, this mobility within the landscape, and we are seeing it as a result of this community project where we are helping a local group. I emphasise that. We're not doing it. We're not doing it with them tagging on the side. We are providing them the training and then providing them the opportunity to actually take it forward. So each of the, the groups are basic fighting instigation. We're just here to help them do something which they don't necessarily have particular rules also to do. And that, as I say, demonstrates the point. It's about community work. It's about giving them the training, giving them the opportunity, and inspiring them to take, take the lessons forward. And the reality is that is exactly what they've done. I've got, about, I've got another five minutes, so okay. Sizer Castle, very quickly moving through, um, is the third of my case studies. And the reason why is because it's a National Trust property. You've probably heard of Sizer Castle. It's a wonderful castle. And that is what everybody appreciates and sees. It's this fantastic, inspiring and wonderful castle. And for most people, and that is a huge number of people who uh, footfall through the site, that is the real deal. That is all there is. That is what you've got. You've got a medieval castle, and it's exciting, it's fantastic, wonderful. But what we discovered is that was only part of the deal, and that was not even the whole deal at all. Because what we did with the Levens Local History Group, and this is basically, again, HLF inspired, is we did a complete archaeological survey of the whole of the, of the estate of Sizer. Big, large area. And what we found is there was quite a bit more than just simply um, castles. Here is our castle. But all we've got here, we've got Neolithic Iron Age um, remains, uh, including wonderful example of a Neolithic axe embedded into the Greek of limestone pavement. Fantastic example. Um, we've got, as I say, uh, Iron Age type enclosed settlements. 
Um, a very rich landscape scattered over the area, but most specifically, that little purple dot, which is a burnt mound. What's a burnt mound? Well, you'll see about that in a second. But what we're seeing is a landscape which was extremely rich and much more complicated than we previously suspected. So we set up the next phase of the work, which was to be entirely um, led for the group and was basically using any broad range of techniques we could. So we used instrument survey for a barn, we used LIDAR, we used geophysical survey, excavation, back to this one, and we used drones, we used coring, auger coring, uh, with a Russian auger, wonderful stuff. Um, and we did an instrument survey of the barn. The thing, thing is that our burnt mound and it's that little red circle at the top, um, is in the area of a big hollow. Now, that's not unusual. Burnt mounds, which are basically an opportunity to create hot water. Basically, you take a stone, you heat it up, you throw it into a trough, the water gets warmer, you throw away the stone. You end up with these big piles of burnt stone. Don't get me started on the reason why they did it. I could be here for the next two days. But... Um, that basically is what we do know and we do understand. So they need to near all supply. And that's what we got in this big, large, irregular hollow. So we started doing some coring, <coughs> you know, find a little bit more about our hole. And I should add that what we suspected and we actually were able to confirm is that we had a kettle hole. Kettle hole basically being the residual element of a block of ice at the end of the ice age which basically then melted, this thing's moving, um, move, uh, melted in situ, leaving this big indentation in the ground, which is our kettle hole, which then fills with water, because it's in that position, and it then builds up organic material. So you end up with a wonderful sequence. And essentially, as you can see, we've got basically initial 10,000 to 11,000 Cal BC, and the implication is that the formation of our kettle hole goes back even earlier to the end of the late glacial period. We also had a wonderful story about peak development from about 8,200 Cal BC. Um, and then basically, the thing starting to fill up largely around about the period of the Bronze Age, which is when our burnt mound appeared. So we've got, simply by looking at cores suspended through this big <coughs> aerial bog, which is within a stone throw the size of a castle, and you begin to realise we've got a sequence just within this tiny localised area, a sequence which takes us back literally something like about uh, 12,000 years. And suddenly, and then we've got the, bronze, the burnt mounds, which are wonderful sites, moving very quickly on. You can see it's there, and it's moving on. And you can see the sort of the sequence that we got. Two layers of burnt stone, sitting on peat, uh, preserved trees, and then basically we're now into the uh, organic deposits which take us down through to the, um, uh, the, the stadial. So in other words, what we've actually got ourselves is a fantastic sequence simply by looking at a Bronze Age site. So this is basically an opportunity. And the wonderful story we got is... If you can, I don't know whether you can pick up, but the stone at the top of that section is thinner and smaller than the stuff at the bottom. Two different periods. So in other words, there were two periods of activity for the burnt mound. Coarse sandstone um, and fine sandstone. I should add, it's sandstone. Okay, not a big deal. Apart from the fact this is a limestone area, there's no sandstone in the area all the sandstone had to be brought in, which if you know anything about limestone, about what it's like when you go and take limestone, heat it up and put it into water, um, you begin to realise it's not a very good idea make, using limestone for your burnt stone. It produces slate lime and quick lime and it's not a very nice stuff to go and then basically use whatever activity you're wanting. Um, so they imported their stone a long, long way. But one of the best things that came out of it with that, because we got a trough, a trough where basically all the water was kept, where they 
So to have a nice, wonderful Bronze Age trough perfectly preserved is one of our high points. Moving very quickly on, just to give you an indication, we had a pretty good narrow date range. We're talking about um, basically at the uh, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, and we've got two different episodes of working represented there. Um, it's important from the point of view of understanding Burt Mounds. It's important to try to understand the Bronze Age and the Neolithic. It's taking back the chronology of Burt Mounds significantly. But uh, you represent that simply not to say to rabbit on ad infinitum about Mounds, but I could do. Lovely subject, wonderful site, and the site is. It's about demonstrating what we can do with landscape archaeology as a result of community projects. The point about it is we're doing pure research because that's basically the name of the game. We're doing things which we would not otherwise be able to do. We are inspiring local groups to get more involved in archaeology, to get more involved in field work, and more specifically involved to get involved in landscape survey. One of the advantages of landscape survey is it's something which they're not breaking the ground. So you're not going to have any archaeological curators jumping down there and saying, you're destroying the site, you're destroying the site, don't touch it. They can actually do um, archaeological surveys to their heart's content. And some of these groups have been doing some excellent and fantastic work. Um, really extremely impressive. So what we've got is a situation where we've got community archaeology, which is inspired um, funded largely by things like HLF, which is absolutely crucial, as Mike was saying, absolutely important to take us forward. It's about inspiring the local groups. It's helping them on their way. And then as they basically gain confidence, um, they then take on to the next thing. So basically, it's what essentially is. We are seeing a new revolution um, in landscape research, courtesy of these community projects. And there are things which both the archaeological world and the local communities can justly benefit from. And that's the point. I hope I haven't run over too much. I do apologise.